This is a production of WGBH2 Boston. Tonight on Greater Boston, we are live from New Hampshire. We've transformed the lobby of the Radisson Hotel in Manchester into our WGBH television and radio studio for the next several days. We'll be here till every vote is counted Tuesday night. Maybe the Democratic votes in Iowa will be counted by then too. And we'll be joined by some familiar faces, colleagues Emily Rooney, Adam Riley, Marjorie Egan, on last night's town hall, tonight's debate, and the Des Moines Register calling the Democratic caucus there a debacle. I'll also talk to Bernie Sanders' top campaign advisor, Tad Devine, and we're getting the lay of the land here with some locals, including a former New Hampshire GOP chair, former Democratic candidate for governor, and the head of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College. We're here live in Manchester, just want to make sure you get that. As much as I've criticized the state's first in the nation status, and I assure you I'm not done yet, this is truly the center of the U.S. political universe for the next several days. Candidates and surrogates are everywhere. Adam Riley has been getting the lowdown on the Democratic side. We'll hear from him in a minute. But first, Emily Rooney has been on the ground with the Republicans and has a quick roundup of the day. The Republican candidates were fanned out all over New Hampshire today. Thank you. Thank you. Many, like Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, were doing town hall formats. Good morning. Donald Trump, seeking to regain some momentum after his loss to Ted Cruz in Iowa, packed in a full day of events. Hello, everybody. After an early morning town meeting in Keene, we caught up with New Jersey Governor Chris Christie at Village Pizza in Newport, New Hampshire, where season's greetings still hung despite the decidedly unseasonal weather. Hey, everybody. Inside, about 40 diners eagerly awaited his arrival. Good afternoon, how are you? Hey. Good afternoon. Thank you. Chrissy said his informal poll of 11,000 voters last weekend showed a full 50% undecided. As for his promise that he'll be like gum on the bottom of New Hampshire's shoe. How is the gum sticking? Pretty good. No? Not bad. How Not do you bad. feel? I feel good. Meanwhile, my colleague Adam Riley was out and about with the Democratic crowd today. Adam? Thanks, Emily. I spent the morning at Hillary Clinton's Portsmouth office, where Stephanie Shriok, the head of Emily's List, which works to elect pro-choice Democratic women, kicked off a canvas earlier today. Bernie Sanders is a good vote on women's issues, but we need more than that today. We need to not just hold the line, we need to actually push forward. But that argument hasn't been resonating with younger women who backed Sanders overwhelmingly in Iowa. Shriok says they still don't know enough history and that older Clinton supporters have to teach them. We need to be having the conversations with the entire generation. I mean, for so many of us, particularly sort of my age and older, like we've watched Hillary Clinton you know, continue in her career from the very first job. This is all before this entire generation's you know, memories. So it is for us to see that as a challenge. Which means volunteers like Christine Wheaton pitching Clinton to women half her age. My children, when I got my divorce, were on New Hampshire Healthy Kids because of her. I mean, I have felt her impact, and she is steady, tenacious, and she gets the job done. It's time for a woman to be running the country. Adam and Emily join me now, along with Marjorie Egan, my Boston Public Radio co-host and columnist at CruxNow.com. Great to see all three of you. Before we start, wasn't there supposed to be a canvasser, somebody going yeah, door to door there was for indeed. Clinton? The Clinton campaign was willing to let us film a young woman who was going door to door, but we were told under no circumstances could we ask her any questions. She said no go. Uh, well, we, we shot her. We didn't include her in the package. Right, okay. Yeah. You know, I, for one, love the town hall format. Les, I don't know if you did. I thought it was terrific. I'm assuming at least one piece of that last night is going to be a centerpiece of tonight's debate. Here it is. I do not know any progressive who has a super PAC and takes $15 million from Wall Street. Look, I made speeches to lots of groups. I told them what I thought. I answered questions. But did you have to be paid $675,000? Well, I don't know. Um, that's what they offered. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, every, every Secretary of State that I know has done that. That's what they offered. How does she dig herself out of that Wall Street hole, Marjorie? I don't know, but I just read where Goldman Sachs uh, Chief uh, Lloyd Blankfein called Bernie Sanders' candidacy a dangerous moment, and then he uh, 
I don't think that's going to help Hillary's cause. That should help Hillary. Really. How does she dig herself out of the Wall Street? She keeps trying and trying. And she keeps getting deeper and deeper. The fact that Anderson, you know, Anderson Cooper is asking her why she's paid so much. He, he makes more than that. Yeah, but is he running for president <laughs> as far as I know? People get so upset about what other people make. It I mean, feeds the narrative, does it not, Adam? It's what Bernie Sanders' campaign know, is all about, right? But Compensation, but Wall Street access. It, she's digging herself out the same way she dug herself out of the email crisis, which is she strings it as she's done, you know, white water and everything else, string it along, string it along. Nothing really seems to stick. You say dig her. herself out. There's a front page piece of debate back and forth in the New York Times talking about whether it was just careless or criminal, her email thing. So it surely has not gone away, Emily. I don't think she's dug herself out on either count yet. And I would also add that, I mean, the big problem for her with Wall Street, it's not just the money that she made giving speeches. It's the fact that her husband presided over the deregulation of Wall Street, which a lot of people think led to the financial meltdown of a few years back. But it's also, it's also that I think the people that are so enthusiastic about Bernie Bernie Sanders are these kids that are up to their eye teeth in debt, they're living in their parents' basement, they can't afford to, you know, buy a car or get married and have a kid and stuff, and that's Bernie Sanders' whole thing, that the system is rigged. Yeah, but I'm not saying she's going to take it over, but she has to chip well, yeah, away at she, that I issue. She's convinced people that she will do something about Wall Street, and I think Lloyd Blank finds statements about Bernie Sanders don't help. Don't help. How about the flip side? How does he convince people tonight or going forward that he's not a one-trick pony? He's not Mr. Income Inequality, I'm going to tackle Wall Street, but he actually has the skills and desire to do anything else, Adam, I, or Emily. You know, I think it's problematic. I mean, I think he's, he's garnered all this support from young people, but I think there's still a great deal of skepticism about there, certainly in middle America and, and other places too. He's very, very left. And I just don't think it's going to stick. I mean, I don't think he's going to make it much further than New Hampshire. How about it? Well, I thought that last night's town hall was terrific for him. I think the format let him come across as sort of more mellow and thoughtful than he usually does in the debates. And I think he kind of normalized himself. That comment, uh, you know, the question about his spirituality, and he talked about how he sees suffering and pain happening to other people and feels like it directly impacts him. It was a very mainstream, palatable explanation yeah. for his worldview. And again, I think helped demystify him. Well, her it's also talking about the Jesuit, even though Marjorie said the guy isn't the Jesuit, was a pretty good thing on her front, yeah, too. Yeah, it wasn't no? bad. It wasn't bad. No, it was very nice. Henry, Na Henry Nowen, she talked about. And I think, you know, just not to, to belabor uh, his games no, belabor, in the town hall, but he, he came across as kind of funny. The, Aegis joke was yeah. pretty good. He seemed he seemed less like a strident ideologue and more like someone you could kind of imagine moving beyond New Hampshire. Can we talk about the artist fix his hair too? Well, that matters, doesn't <laughs> it? As we all know. Can we talk about can we talk about something that muttered, muddied the waters even further? It's my favorite story of the day. It is unbelievable. We thought Iowa was over, except for Donald Trump's ridiculous call for this nullification or a redo. Well, the newspaper, the most important newspaper in Iowa, the Des Moines Register, which endorsed Hillary Clinton, said this today in an editorial. Read this. It's called Something Smells in the Democratic Party. Once again, the world is laughing at Iowa. What happened Monday night at the Democratic caucuses was a debacle, period. The path forward is clear. Work with all the campaigns, the audit results, break silly partisan party tradition, release the raw vote totals. We know what the delegate thing is. I, I talked to Tad Devine about this in a couple of minutes. This could, if it turns out he won the popular vote, assuming we ever know, that could give a boost, could it not, for the to the Sanders well, campaign? There's another thing that's happening here, that now that suddenly he's been taking more seriously, you see the Democratic machine or a lot of Democratic politicians start to criticize him. Gene Shaheen's been, been, been tough on him. Other Big people, Hillary Clinton's work. Yes, other people have been tough on him. So the idea that the, the Democratic machine is in line with Hillary Clinton doesn't help her either. What was that license plate story? See, yes, exactly. Dem the woman who is in charge of the Democratic yeah. Party in Iowa who says we're not going to count the raw votes, her license plate, according to two accounts, is HRC 2016. Yeah, now that's a neutral like force, yeah, isn't it? I'm going to take issue with the, once again, the whole world is laughing in Iowa. Yes. It's about the caucus system. It has nothing to do with just the Democratic Emily, Party. We don't know the, the raw system, votes. All we I, know, I know is, but, is but, he, but she, Jim, they've never, they've never mattered. I mean, this is, this is, their, this is the system that Iowa Wait, has in place. Mattered? The raw votes. Oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah, but this is the way they do it. Yeah, it's the way they do it. I actually wonder if it might not be more of a boost for Sanders if this continues festering and if stuff like this woman's license plate come to light and you know the Democratic Party says, no, no, we're not going to do it. I feel like that, you know, that drives home this notion that... you look at the outsider thing that fuels the Trump campaign and fuels the Sanders campaign. And the more inside, the more rigged, the more beholden... He's one of the anti-establishment candidates in some ways. Let's talk polls briefly if we can. This is the latest GOP poll that UMass Lowell 
tracking poll every uh, single night. We'll just do the Republican side here. Marco Rubio seems to be the man of the moment. Uh, came in third in Iowa. He's up seven points in three days in New Hampshire. Trump is down two points. The margin's still 21, but it was 30 over Rubio. He's the man of the moment, it appears here, yeah, is he, he not? He is, but there's a, isn't there a pretty big margin of error yeah. in that poll? Yeah, there is. Remember, you know, so, so the numbers may or may not be as that impressive as they seem. And he's also but it been, feeds the narrative. It feeds the narrative. This. It feeds the narrative, as did the fact that even though he finished in third in Iowa, he was being cast as the winner by finishing in third. I mean, right now, all the sort of narrative cards are falling perfectly right yeah. for Marco Rubio. But we'll see if he can take it. He's very cautious. I saw him a couple weeks ago at this town hall. Everyone was there except Trump. Uh, it was in Nashua. He was unwilling to say anything going after Trump. No indirect jabs, no explicit attacks on Trump. He was far and away the most timid. You know, Jeb Bush is completely happy to go after Trump. John Kasich will go after Trump. Rubio wouldn't. So and I wonder if that's what he's Did you get a Rubio feel? Yeah. I tell you what I got a feel for, not just from, I, I was actually with Chris Christie, but from the people I spoke to. Chris Christie said he took this informal poll last weekend, yeah. 11,000 people he polled, 50% said they were undecided. I actually believe that. That's what Jennifer, Jennifer Horn, chair of the Republican yeah. Party, told Marjorie and me today. The Chris Christie event today were undecided. I, I was asking them, <laughs> about, well, you know, well, well they still don't know enough about the candidates. Yeah, exactly. Okay, right. we only have a couple of minutes. Left. Here's your opportunity to be wrong about tonight's okay, debate. I'm ready. We'll go down the list. What is, what's the major takeaway going to be? What's the major theme? What's the It's the first head to head, one on one debate now that O'Malley's out. What are we going to be talking about tomorrow morning out of this debate? I think you're going to be talking, well, my guess is the big thing with Hillary Clinton, is she authentic? Can we believe her? Can we trust her? Is she going to seem like she is uh, more sincere than a lot of her critics have said today? I think that's a big deal for Hillary Clinton. How about Clinton. you, Emily? Well, you know, he's already said, I'm sick of hearing about your emails. We can't bring that up, right? I mean, but the moderators can bring up the emails. The moderators can bring it up. But I, I, I think the financial situation is a serious one, the Goldman Sachs movie. But you know what? I think everybody's anticipating the next debate on Saturday night with mm -hmm. Republicans, and this one's going to kind true, of like get, take a pass. Now, I actually think, you know, by the way, the town hall, just before you say, the town hall format, if I were in charge, yeah. where thankfully I, I do only town yeah, falls. It was so yeah. smart, yeah. so good, Anderson, so thoughtful. Great. The question is, you get to good. finish it. So All right, what's here's the my takeaway? prediction. She'll try to stop playing defense on this progressive issue, and she will attack Sanders as being uninterested and unqualified when it comes to national security. Boy, good. you are really on your good game. Idea. Yeah, it is, it is. It is. Adam, Emily, and Marjorie, this is fun. Yes, yeah, a week great. of this we're, we're is great. Back. Good to see you all. We'll see you again in the next show. Thanks so much, everybody. Earlier today, I caught up with Tad Devine. Tad is the top strategist for Bernie Sanders' campaign. And I asked him about that Des Moines Register editorial and what it means for his candidate. When I read that editorial this morning from a very respected newspaper that endorsed Hillary Clinton, I, too, was surprised that they would be so uh, strong in what they said. Uh, the reason we're not making a big issue out of it, I guess, number one, we don't want to be like Trump and, you know, what he did with Trump. Was it, oh, it's, yeah, but he's alleging fraud and all this other stuff. We're, we're making no such allegations. Here's what we're doing. Uh, that decision came about very quickly. There's a difference of four state delegate equivalencies with 1,406 del you know, delegates uh -huh. at stake. Uh, our campaign on that night found different, you know, got information that there were many, as many as 50 caucus sites where there were some issues. And so we said, we'd like to do something about it. The state party said, no, this is it, final decision. And what we decided to do and what we're doing right now is going to every one of our precinct captains, over 1,600 of them, asking them what happened, recounting things. We believe mistakes were made that night. Is we it really possible do. you won the popular vote? I it, know it's about delegates. I, I, it's possible it, Sanders it, won the popular it, it, is po it is possible, and we'd like the state party to release the popular vote numbers. They've done it in the past, by the way. Everybody has memorized the age gap out of, uh, out of Iowa, 70 points, 17 to 29. By the way, Barack Obama only won that age group by right. 43 points in 2008. Pretty significant gap amongst older voters for Hillary Clinton, though not sure. quite as large. Here's my thesis. Old voters are used to disappointment. The ups and downs of Clinton, they'll be there. Young voters, when they have their first serious disappointment, your guy loses South Carolina or he loses Nevada, are they going to be there or are they going to go home as quickly as they came to the campaign? The disaffected, idealistic young voter. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean, and I don't, I don't think they're going to go home. I mean, listen, I think what Bernie is inspiring in these young people is real. I think he's going to be able to pull them out the way Barack Obama did in 2008. You know, when Obama won Indiana and North Carolina in the general election in 2008, those are two states that hadn't been targeted by Democrats in a generation. I worked on a lot of campaigns. We know, I worked on a campaign with John Kerry where we had a running mate for North Carolina. We couldn't target North Carolina John because Edwards when we polled it, it wasn't there. Yeah. And, you know, 
what Obama did in those two states, he won one age group, 18 to 29 year olds, in Indiana and North Carolina, and he won those states. So I think that's what Bernie is capable of, changing the calculus of American politics by bringing people in, particularly young people. Tuesday night, your guy wins. He's still got a pretty significant lead, even in this UMass tracking poll, right. still 20 some points. The Clinton campaign and the pundits say he's the hometown guy. He's from a well, neighboring state. <laughs> What's the big deal? Yeah. He almost essentially sure. is like winning Vermont. Well, you know, there's a lot of spin here. There's no doubt about it. I mean, listen, here, here's our side of the spin story if you want to hear it. This is the fourth Clinton for president campaign in New Hampshire. They go back to 1992. She won the New Hampshire primary the last time she was here. She defeated Barack Obama. So I think to say, well, you know, Bernie has an incredible advantage. And, you know, I've worked for candidates who are neighboring uh, state candidates, Mike Dukakis, John Kerry. Mm -hmm. And you do get a big advantage, particularly for Massachusetts, where 25 percent of the voters live in the Boston media market. Now, when you're the Vermont candidate like Howard Dean, or the main candidate like Ed Muskie, you don't necessarily get as big an advantage here in, in New Hampshire. You can see that interview in full online at greaterboston.org. And obviously, we've invited the uh, Clinton campaign to send a representative. I know it's no secret I'm no fan of the whole first in the nation status thing for New Hampshire. Of course, as Mike Barnacle told us earlier on Boston Public Radio, New Hampshire is Brooklyn compared to Iowa. But I'm still not convinced about this hometown advantage thing. Joining me for that and much more are Fergus Cullen. Fergus is the former chair of the New Hampshire Republican State Committee, the youngest ever. I don't know why that matters. He's now executive vice president of the Center for Research and and public policy, also the author of Granite Steps, Stumbles, Surprises, and Successes on the New Republican, uh, pardon me, New Hampshire Primary Trail. Great to see you, Fergus. Uh, uh, we should mention he's supporting John Kasich, but he's also hosted a slew of parties for other candidates. As for the woman sitting beside him, that, of course, would be Arnie Arneson. Arnie's a former New Hampshire state rep, making 100 a year. She's a Democratic <laughs> candidate for governor and now host of The Attitude on WNHN. We're also joined by Neil Levesque, I'm almost done, executive director of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics and Political Library at St. Anselm College right here in Manchester. Great to see all three of you. you. Starting with you, you get 30 seconds to tell me I am clueless. New Hampshire is the perfect place. 30 seconds only, each of you, the perfect place for the First Nation primary. Take it's it away, the, Fergus. It's the last place where candidates have a two-way conversation with the constituents that they hope to lead. They have honest interactions with voters, and it's, again, a two-way conversation, a level playing field, an equal opportunity. They don't all win, but they go home saying, I had my shot. I love those two-way conversations with Donald Trump talks to 10,000 people and 10,000 talk back. Arnie, you get your 30 seconds. Well, first of all, I want to welcome you to the New Hampshire equivalent of the Mardi Gras. So that's really <laughs> what this is. You didn't know it happens every four years. Uh, but let me just say something about Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump has been doing living rooms. Uh, because he's been on TV for how many years? And the TV is usually in the living room or the bed. He's even done the bedrooms. So he has actually been here, and that's where there's a falsehood. He can have these huge crowds, but there's also been an intimacy with Donald Trump. That's your that, 30 seconds. That's my call. Okay, how about it? Well, I think New Hampshire is the right place for this because it's good for the other 49 states. This is a place where candidates get tested. They ask the questions, the follow-up questions, but it's also very good for people in your business. No other state can people ask questions. Reporters, too. That's so totally true. And you have no access like you don't in New Hampshire. But you would also agree that the, the great line from John Sununu, the elder, the former governor, that Iowa picks corn, we pick presidents, is, it's an iffy proposition. Is that, a, is that a fair statement? Absolutely. But this, we are putting them through a test. This is very different than a caucus. Uh, it's a very different election. I expect that we'll have huge voter turnouts next year. Let's pop up a poll. I know people are sick of polls, so we'll give them one. We did the GOP in a second. Here's the Democratic uh, poll. The most. This is the UMass uh, Channel 7 uh, nightly tracking poll. And admittedly, there's a margin of error issue, uh, et cetera. But on February 1st, uh, Sanders was up on Clinton 31 points. She's now up, uh, hey, pardon me, he's now up at 20 two uh, nine-point difference in just three days. What does history suggest about huge front-runners coming into town? Do they survive the week after Iowa, Neil? Uh, this is a time when we wait for that New Hampshire moment, that one week where all the churning going on. A lot of people are still making up their mind. The way, yeah. They're yeah, still yeah. making up that we have big swings in this week. Anything could happen. He certainly, though, has high expectations. So there's no guarantee in any of your minds that Sanders and, and uh, Trump are the winners here? Oh, absolutely not. Why not? Well, first of all, what is it? 40% undecided. 45% of the electorate are what's called undeclared, which means they can either pick up a Democratic ballot or a Republican ballot. I was married to an undeclared. And let me just tell you, I did not know what he was going to do and which ballot he would pick up until he walked into the voting booth. And if there was a conversation with him, I thought I knew him. I never did. Speaking of those undeclared, do you buy the notion, I know you've written about this, that there are some people who don't just decide which party to be in because that's where they want their vote heard, but they vote strategically. They want to vote, stop Donald Trump. 
they even though they're a democrat uh, pardon me an independent an undeclared leading democratic they vote republican in an attempt to derail a county do you buy that no, or is that I, an aberration no i don't think that really happens with many people you know back in 2000 john mccain attracted so many independents to the republican primary that it probably cost bill bradley mm -hmm. a win exactly. against al gore there were enough votes in that year that bill bradley could have won and john mccain could have won but he sort of hogged them all you know since you're the democrat not the undeclared in the middle yeah. when hillary clinton is attempting like everybody does this in all races trying to lower expectations you know he's the next door neighbor thing as i just discussed with dad he's got, she's got the whole political infrastructure of the democratic party she gene shaheen the governor virtually every elected official virtually every how can she make the claim she that can't. he's the favorite son she, here she, well she can't because she's been running here since 1991 as i said right, she won she, in 2008 right, right. and on top of which i mean there are grandchildren that you know her their grandparents were working on her campaign in 1991 with bill and now they're still in the in, in the in the fold the problem is she has the organization she has the money she has the networks she has the shaheen machine she has the Maggie Hassan machine so when it comes to machine politics she has it what Bernie has obviously is the passion is the, uh, speaking of passion there's also the age divide which is just stunning to me out of and you've all seen it out of Iowa is that going to play out in a similar way here Neil or do you th is it going to be muted to some Absolutely. degree and I think it's going to play out when they go to these debates there's a debate tonight at a university a whole bunch of university students in that hall I mean we don't know what the audience will do um, but we see it every day with the people that are going door to door. A lot of young people for, are for Bernie Sanders. You know, I, I want to talk to you about well, your successor. Jennifer Horn was here today with us on the radio. Uh, she made a comment a couple of months ago that got her in a little bit of hot water, at least with the Trump people, because they're all supposed to be totally uh, uh, neutral. Shallow campaigns, she said on November 25th, that depend on bombast and divisive rhetoric, do not succeed in New Hampshire. I don't expect that they will. Now, uh, she didn't mention Trump. She was obviously talking about uh, Donald Trump. Is she right? I don't expect that they will now. Is she on to something? Are people ultimately going to say, despite this intimate relationship when he was on television, we don't like this kind of campaign? Is there any sign they don't like his campaign? Well, sure. I mean, I think there are two-thirds of the Republican Party who are against Trump. They just haven't decided who it is that they're going to support instead. Uh, I, listen, it's a thankless job being state party chair, but Donald Trump very well may win this primary. The real contest here is there, who's second, who's third. They're not necessarily competing with Trump or needing to beat him, but they are competing with each other to have the right to take on Trump in another state and to stop him. Doesn't, if Trump wins this thing, doesn't it undercut all the things you were explaining to me five minutes ago about why this is the perfect state no. to go number one? Well, why no? no. For he destroys years, all the... Two years ago, he started campaigning in the state. I have gone with him. I have held events where he's answered every single question in the audience. Just because the room is big doesn't mean he's not answering questions. He's been campaigning here. He has a national uh, audience, but he still comes back to New Hampshire. So I disagree with the notion that he hasn't been campaigning in the New Hampshire way. He's winning because he's hitting the nerve of a certain segment of the Republican Party activists and they love him. By the way, in your defense, we had an activist in his campaign, Carl Zahn, here today, who said he went to an event several months and months ago for Trump where there were three people at it. He was one of the three, and it built from there. Okay, starting here, since we don't talk about issues enough, quickly on the Republican side, what issue matters most to people who take Republican ballots here, Neil? I think it's Obama malaise. They're mad, and Trump's statement of Make America Great Again is a response to that. David Axelrod wrote a great piece in the New York Times about a week ago saying, I can't believe I dismissed Donald Trump for exactly that reason. Uh, elections often turn on the reaction to the person who went before. What's the most important issue to Republicans here, Ferguson? The New Hampshire electorate is a fiscally conservative electorate. I don't think there's any question about that. But I also think a good third of the party says, you know, I think America's pretty great already. I'm not, I, don't, I haven't given up on America's ability to solve problems, and I expect that our best days are ahead of us. There's only one candidate who's really talking that kind of positive vision. So I think a third of the party is really going to reject uh, this idea that America's in decline, which is what Trump is saying. The perfect person to ask what Republicans are thinking, of course, yeah, Arnie Arson. So you complete that, and then we'll move to the Democratic side. I, I think the anger thing is exactly what Donald Trump has really sort of tapped into, and, and it's, it's an anger and a frustration with actually government itself. And so uh, nobody else can actually say that but him, because he's such an outsider. And I think that's one of the things that you're seeing resonate with the base. And then the question is, how do the little governors like compete with that? Because the they're bringing it. Well, they're, they're all bringing. They're all bringing their resumes.
resumes, and nobody wants to hear about a resume. What they really want to hear about is someone who will sort of change the system. Okay, quickly, we can't talk about the little governors. We can talk about the little senators and the former uh, little sen. On the Democratic side, what are Democrats in the state looking for in Sanders or Clinton? What's going to turn that race? Oh, you know, I, San Bernie Sanders is getting support from people who believe in Bernie, but they're also getting his support from people who want to send the message that they're tired of the Clintons or they're dissatisfied with her. He'll take those votes either way they come, but I don't think he's going to win this thing by 20 or 30 points like polls are suggesting. How about you, Arne? Um, I think the inequality issue is huge. I think the jobs issue is huge. And I think money and politics is huge. Do you care about and foreign policy where she brings all this expertise? Does, that's not the issue right now in this campaign. And I think what's really important is the money and politics things goes to the Wall Street problem. That they're totally connected. Neil, you got to finish it. Well, his ad says the system is rigged against you, which is an amazing statement when you think about the fact that his party or people who believe in the same things he do have been in power for seven years. The system is rigged against you. It's an amazing statement. But it's, it's working, working, right? It's working. It's a movement. I love the smile on your face when you're saying that, too. Neil, Arne, Ferguson, it is great to see all three of you. Thanks so much. We'll see you a lot this week. You know, as you may have heard, a local Boston legend, that's Ernie Bach Jr., you know, from the Auto Mile, is a big supporter of Donald Trump. He's thrown fundraisers, he's spoken on his behalf, but this morning on CNN, he explained how he got there in a most unusual way. Well, you got to think of it like this. It's, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and there's a few, you know, girls at the bar. You have to go home with one of them, so you have to pick who you're with, and I think I'm, I think Mr. Trump is the best qualified. Hold on a second. Ernie, your analogy for what makes you the right guy when you get the bad call at 2 o'clock in the morning is what you need to do in the bar when you have women there and you have to decide no, which no, one. That's how your head works. You're, misund you're misunderstanding. I'm saying if, you, if, you, you know, if you're single, you understand this. You know, it's the end of the night. You, 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 you want to go home with somebody. You know, the bar, the, the bar is about to close. You, you have to pick somebody. You have to pick somebody. You have to stand behind somebody. And I think if you, if you line up all the candidates with their positives and their negatives, I think Mr. Trump is the man. It's the end of the night. Women at the bar, come on down. What do you think? Email us, tweet us, share your thoughts. Hope you'll join Marjorie Egan and me on Boston Public Radio tomorrow at 11. That's it for me this week on TV, though. Please come back tomorrow for Beat the Press. Emily Rooney and her panel will be taking a closer look at the media's role in all this first-in-the-nation madness. I'll be back live on Monday right here in Manchester, New Hampshire. Hope to see you then.